Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Today is March 8, 2004, and we are going to be giving this interview for the History Makers. Uh, with us, we have Scott Stearns, the videographer, Larry Crow with the History Makers. Observing, we have Jason Poe, and I'm your interviewer, Donna Elan. Can you please state your name? My name is Harriet Ramsey Bates. And can you spell And that's B-A-T-E-S. Excellent. Thank you. You want me to spell Harriet, H-A-R-R-I-E-T, one T. Okay. Uh, the date and place of your birth? Uh, I was born in Chambers County, August the 16th. You want the year? 1940. Please. One. Okay, and your occupation? I am a retired county agent coordinator with Auburn University. And your educational background? I have two master's degree. I have one in home economics education and a second master's in guidance and counseling. Thank you. What we'd like to do is begin <coughs> with, if you can describe to us what was life like for African Americans before the Civil Rights Movement? I grew up in a school system that was supposed to be separate but equal. However, there was nothing equal about the school system that I grew up in. But my parents and other adults always taught us that uh, white kids are not superior. They are superior only because you allow them to be. My grandmother said, if you don't read, you don't have anything to talk about. So we had to constantly read to keep up. But going back to the schools being separate but not equal, we always received, I grew up in a textile mill town. And in that town, they made, uh, text, they made towers and pillowcases known as West Point Pepper Mill Store. In that mill town, they provided the children with books. They provided us with seats. But the white kids always got the new books and the new seats, and we got the old seats from the white schools. Do you remember the, your first encounter, your first personal um, encounter with racism? Actually, I can recall so many, but the one that stands out most in my mind, my father was a local self-made contractor who helped to build schools, houses, and everything. He had his own contracting business, but there were several rich white uh, people that he worked for, that he built houses for, he kept up their property and everything. I remember on one occasion we went to, we were headed to Ohio in my father's car, and the car broke down. I think I was in about the fifth or sixth grade. So he called the white doctor that he worked for. So the white doctor called another white doctor in Tennessee and told him to go out and take care of Betty Rams. And so when the white guy came, the doctor came with his mechanic and everything. He said, I'm supposed to get these niggas and take them to the hotel. Well, you know, at that time, we were not allowed in the hotel. But with the white doctor in Tennessee, he put us in the very last room at the hotel, and we were not to even breathe loud. And we had to stay there while they go and take my daddy's car and get it fixed. However, they took care of us. But it was so embarrassing to have to be very, very quiet in the last room in the hotel. That was my first really, really for somebody to call you nigger, you know, you get in the car, we're going to take care of you because you're Mr. Charlie's Negroes. Okay. Tell us some more of your most memorable encounters with racists and racism. Okay, I'll just move forward and talk a little bit about my college days at Alabama State. Uh, my father was killed in 1959 because he was helping to get the NAACP active in Alabama. However, the excuse was that uh, uh, Mr. Chambers got killed. So, you know, they tried to say that maybe he was involved in that, but everybody knew that he was not. My father was missing for a whole month, and uh, he was later found in the creek, and he was tied with some boot strings. So, you know, that is painful for me even to this day. And I have all the newspapers and all the articles from that time, and sometimes I'd like to share that with you. But that was a very dehumanizing time for me. Also, I participated in the sit-ins uh, during the 60s. I was at Alabama State, and we had a place called H.L. Greens, and we would go down and attempt to be served. However, we was never served. And we would spit on, and they would throw water on us, or just any nasty thing they wanted to do. 
And I almost got arrested one day, but we were told to always stay in groups. So when the wagon was filled and they could not take any more of us to, to the jail that day, I went on back to the college. That was real frightening because we were told to never be alone, to always be with a group. And if you really recall in the 60s, uh, everyone, all black students did not want to participate at that time. And you were kind of isolated if you were starting trouble downtown or in school. But there were 10 or 12 of us working with Bernard Lee and some others from the northern states, and we personally got to know him with that experience. What drew you to the Civil Rights Movement? I think knowing that there was just something wrong about it, uh, I always felt that I'm as good as anybody because we were taught that and to feel like another race of people are better than you are just because of the color of their skin, I just couldn't buy that. But with my father's death, it most certainly gave me the kind of grit and courage to go out and do anything. I was willing to die for what I believed and I believe that if we uh, decided to continue the fight, one day we would be where we are today. Were you involved uh, with the Selma March? Okay, I came to Selma 21 years old, just out of college, and I taught in a segregated school. Uh, during the time of the movement, we were told, uh, you can't miss school, you have to be here every day. Even if you're sick and you have a doctor's excuse, you still have to be here. So what we did, we would go to school in the morning and we would join the movement in the afternoon. Uh, I remember one day there was a little boy in my room named James, named, named James Earl Hatcher. And all the children left the classroom that day but James Earl. So I got right in his face and I said, James Earl, why aren't you going with the other children? And he told me, his mother told him not to go because she would be put off the white man's place. And I asked him, do you think the other children had permission? I think you should go. So at that time, he got up and he joined the movement. But that was a very, very strange time for us, for all of us in Selma. Uh, I remember being on the bridge, Bloody Sunday. First of all, we were in Brown's Chapel Church, and um, the officials were talking to Dr. King. Dr. King was not there that Sunday. They kept calling him, and we sit and we waited in the church for hours for Dr. King to give us permission to move. I remember marching that Sunday in my high heel shoes because at that time that was kind of just what we had on for church. And the people along the way between here and the projects were talking to us. They said they were frightened for us. They would pray for us and everything. However, we didn't know what was going to happen. We thought they would take all of us to jail that Sunday. We had no idea that when we got to the bridge that we would see the sea of troopers and the billy clubs and the horses and everything. I remember to this day where I was standing at the lower part of the bridge over next to the Selma Times office on that side. And the tear gas was so strong that day, it just looked like a fog. You really couldn't see the end of your nose and yet the horses were coming after you. And there were some black men saying, we need to go home and get our guns. And the officials told us not to do that, to go back to the church because you don't have enough guns. But it was so frightening and you know, we just felt we were gonna die. I just knew I was gonna die, but at that time it really didn't matter because what we believed in, we believed in it so strongly. And going back to the movements, the mass meetings and things, I remember being in church the first night we had the movement in Tabernacle Baptist Church. You seldom hear that. Most people will say that the movement started at Brown's Chapel. But no, we had a pastor out of New York, no, out of Chicago. His name was L.L. L. Anderson. And uh, the members and the officials at Tabernacle Baptist Church said, no, we don't want to have a movement in this church because we are frightened. They will tear up our church. Uh, our church might be bombed. But Reverend Anderson told us, that if we can't have the movement, the mass meeting in our church, we will have it out on the steps. So at that time, the uh, church officials, I assume, gave him permission because the first mass meeting was held in Tabernacle Baptist Church. Do you remember the date? Uh, 
No, I don't. I really don't remember the date. I remember it was the same date as the date Mr. Barrington. You probably heard a lot about Mr. Barrington, who was a civil rights leader, dad. But that night, uh, it was really hard to get uh, people to go to the mic and speak. They were really frightened to death. But after King, Dr. King started coming to Selma, then everybody wanted to get to the mic, all the little preachers and everything. But at first, it was not that way. People were afraid. When you talk about the fear mm -hmm. that you, you heard people speak about, mm -hmm. can you describe some of the, I guess, the feelings that the people in the community, did they talk about it uh, amongst each other? Or did they just talk about it in the church? Well, meetings? we talked about it because there were many people who were losing jobs. I remember Don Restholm, most of the staff at that time were black and they lost their jobs because at that time you would have people coming to the mass meetings, taking pictures, you know, they come in our church and they take pictures of you. Then they would go back and get the pictures developed and if you were in that picture then that was caused to lose your job. So a lot of people talked about it and we banded together with everything that we had. I was making less than $300 a month, but it was nothing for me to give somebody $20 or $30 or go to the grocery store and buy them some grocery. Because I had help from back home. You know, my family would send me money to make it from one payday to the next. And I only had a little 64 Chevrolet here. So, you know, it was a time when black people really, really uh, band together and work for the good of everybody. You know, you just knew when you saw a black person, that person was for you. Not quite like now. Uh, my church also hosted people who wanted to sleep in the church. We had food and we had clothes in Tabernacle Baptist Church during the movement. And um, while we're talking about the mass meetings mm -hmm. and the movements, I don't know if you realize it, but uh, the crowd grew so large until, especially on the nights Dr. King would be here. Uh, First Baptist Church hosted the young people, have you been told that before? And Brown's Chapel hosted the older people. So at that time I was in my early 20s, so sometimes we would go from church to church just to hear and to see Dr. King and to be among uh, the movers of this world, the movers and shakers of this world. What did you learn during those meetings and the training that you went through? Can you describe that? Uh, the first thing I learned, uh, when I came to Dallas County, I had registered to vote in Chambers County, which is a predominantly white uh, county, and I had a major in history. So they were looking for people to go and stand in line. You know, some days we would, before the heat of the movement, you could miss school and be sick. I remember standing in line for a day or so to register to vote, and when I got inside the courthouse, they told me, you passed the written exam. But when they asked me, how much water is out here in this Alabama River? Well, I didn't know. So they told me I didn't pass the test. So, you know, that was the kind of thing. Even as a history major, I could not pass the, I passed the written test, but I could not pass the oral test. So, you know, it was a feeling of not fear, but of hate. Let's talk about you, you, went, you were involved in the, the mass meetings, the attempts, and you spoke a little bit about um, Bloody Sunday. Were you involved with all three attempts uh, in yes. the march? Can uh -huh. you describe? Uh, the, as a classroom teacher, we were involved during the day, like the Sundays and the times that we came to the bridge, all three of those attempts. Mm -hmm. But you must remember the next morning we had to be in the classroom. Let me just speak to the point of the night Viola Luzzo died. We had been over to uh, St. Jude Hospital parking lot, you know. The marchers were camped out in back of the hospital that night. It was really rainy, it was muddy. Uh, you know, your, your, your shoe just got muddy up to your ankle. Harry Belafonte and uh, Sammy Davis Jr. and all the entertainers were there entertaining us and the energy was so high and we were just so excited because the next day they were going to march on into Montgomery to the Capitol. So we were headed back to Selma that night and we had to stop. The troopers and everybody stopped us because there was a lot of excitement in the road. We didn't know what was going on. And People would pass by those that could get by because they were the Ku Klux Klan's or the um, officials like the state troopers or the policemen. 
they would shoot up in the air and make a funny noise and we were sitting there and, you know just praying saying Lord take care of us because we just know whatever's going on up there we didn't know if they were killing all the niggas car by car <laughs> we just didn't know I mean we were really really frightened so when they finally let us by then we realized that she had been killed but we sitting in that road I know for hours and we knew we wasn't going to get to school the next day of course we went home and we washed our face and went on to school that next day but we were so frightened. You were frightened. Did you, but you kept, you had the strength to keep to going. To keep going. Uh -huh. Because if you've ever lived in a segregated world, and I do mean a segregated world where you know you're not treated like other people, rather than to turn back, you'd much rather die. Mm -hmm. Because do you know what it's really like to live in a segregated world? where if you're downtown, you can't get water from a fountain, you can't go to the bathroom, you know, you just can't live like anybody else. So rather than to go back to that, you would much rather die. You mentioned that in, in 1959 that your father mm -hmm. was killed. Mm -hmm. What happened to your father's killer? My father's what? Killer. Uh, my father's killer was never brought to justice. In fact, until this day, we do not know who killed my father. Um, at that time, you know, black folks was afraid to say anything. They were afraid to tell you anything. And my mother was treated so very bad during that time because the FBI and the police would come to the house and question her about his, where he was. And they knew more about where he was than she did. And she had two little children at home that day. But to this day, no one has ever been punished for that crime. And it hurts me more than you can ever realize. And uh, someday I'd like to get that story out. Uh, when and where? Uh, that was in Chambers County, a uh, place called Valley, Alabama, 1959. Okay. December of 1959. He was missing from December. Uh, 1959 to January 18th, uh, 1960. Is that part of what's driven you, your knowing that you didn't want to live in segregation, but also that there was a reason for that death? And did, did that drive some of, the, of your involvement in the civil rights movement? Well, my father, believe it or not, always felt that you know, his children was as good as anybody else in the world. And he taught us that we were as good as anybody else. And we didn't have to take second best. And I guess I grew up knowing that if we continued to push forward, we would someday be able to reach a better medium. And that drive has helped me over the years to know to stand for whatever is right. Mm -hmm. You spoke about the march and, and the fear that you knew was there and feeling scared. Why did so many people continue to take the risk of another harsh beating even though they knew what could happen? What do you think? I really like feel like uh, growing up in the South in the 50s and 60s, uh, one of the things that troubled me today when I think about young people, we knew that whatever we did, we had to do it for all black people. You know, if you had a, an opportunity to, to speak, you were not just speaking for yourself. You were speaking for other black children. And I don't know if I'm answering your question, am I? But that within itself helped us because whatever you did today would be for the young people, for the children of tomorrow, for the people of tomorrow. Because when I came to Dallas County, uh, there were some people working and not even making minimum wages. They were living out on... Uh, white people farmed, and they could tell you today to get up and move. And I just knew that no one should have to live like that. I had never lived in a rented house in my life, and to teach students who came from homes where they are in school today and tomorrow you ask them, why weren't you here last week? And they tell you, well, we got put off Mr. John's uh, farm. And uh, I remember one family in particular the boy told me that they had moved four times in two years, and every time they tore the house down 
and they build another house on someone else's place. Well, you and I can't even imagine that, but that's what happened, you know. It wasn't much house anyway, as he explained to me. So when the man said, get off my place, you tore the whole house down. And then you build the house someplace else. So it was really, really bad. You spoke about how important it was to be part of this movement to make a difference. Can you define what civil rights, the term civil rights means to you? Um, the term civil rights mean that I'm as good as you. I can do anything you can do. I have the same opportunities you have because we fought for those rights. And also, we are not there yet. You know, we have to keep working. We have to keep pushing. We have to keep praying. And things will get better. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you. Not quite? No, no, I'm just in awe. You're yeah. fantastic. Oh, this came up. We're good. We're good. Okay. okay. Mrs. Spades, um, you were involved with all of the attempts uh, in the Selma March. Can you describe how you felt when you saw people being beaten, and were you injured yourself? Okay, you know, like, with everybody, we were not in the front of the line. People like John Lewis and all the dignitaries were in the front of the line. People like me, we were kind of near the foot of the bridge. And when people start running back, naturally they are the horse or something kind of knocks some of us down. I fell down, but Miss Cooper, Annie Cooper, not the Annie Cooper, you know, uh, picked me up and we just kept on running. You know, the little injury didn't bother you anyway. You knew what you wanted. And you knew if you had an opportunity to come back, you would come back because we truly wanted to give Americans the right to vote. That was what we wanted. And nothing was going to stop us. It's kind of like when you wanted that red wagon or you wanted that pretty doll. You know, you were willing to do anything to get it. We wanted freedom because we knew we were not free. Did you fight back? Did we fight back? No. Um, Dr. King had taught us in his meetings and in his sessions. And like I said, as, at my age, there was a lady named Margaret Moe, and you've probably heard a lot about her. She opened up her home to young people to teach them how to vote, and I thought I was a little smarter than I, you know, I thought I could help too. So I went to some of the meetings, and uh, we would go over what we thought would be on the uh, registration form, and. We told them, you know, even if they say something ugly to you because the registrars would, you know, they'd say anything ugly to you once you were in there. It was not about voting. It was just about being nasty. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. As you were marching, were there periods of times that you wanted to turn back, um, being tired or with the fear? That was before you. Okay, let me answer this question that this way. Now, you must remember we participated, or I participated, in all three of the attempts. But I did not walk the 50 miles from Selma to Montgomery. We only met with the group at night, because we had to be in the classroom during the day. And let me speak to uh, the point of being in the classroom every day. When I first came to Dallas County, uh, the students would come to school in September and they would register, and they would go back home and stay until after November when they picked all the, the cotton. So the first month I came to Selman Dallas County and I marked all the children that did not come to my class absent, so the principal said, I was Miss Ramsey at that time, you have to go back to your room and mark these children present. And I said, why? They were not here. He said, because they live out on these farms, and these farm owners own the school system, so you have to mark them. So I said, well, Mr. Cam, I don't have anything. I can put my things in my car any day and go back to Chambers County or someplace else. He said, well, please sit down. You have a lot to offer these children. I really want you to stay here. And, you know, he, he dealt with me in that fashion, so naturally I had to go back and mark the children present. But that was something I never liked. And I also knew if we could get them off of the farm, they would be able to come to school. So that, too, made freedom more interesting for people like me. Were there other encounters that you can recall that just didn't sit well with you? Well, the fact that as a classroom teacher, you knew that you made one 
salary and the white teacher made another salary. That was not good. Um, you knew that uh, they were not making the same amount of money on any jobs you made. You knew that there were people working in the homes making a dollar a day and yet they had to pay the same things for groceries and clothes that you had to pay. All those things just um, felt like a knife being stuck in your heart day after day. You wanted to help mankind and you were willing to do anything to help your people. Do you think it's important for children today to read and learn more about the Civil Rights Movement and why? I really do because I feel like children of my race and of any race, I think they place too much emphasis on clothes. I think they place too much emphasis on baggy britches, you know, the pants. And I think they have misplaced values, I, I guess is what I'm saying. And I think if they were able to walk the roads that we walked, if they were able to sit in the seats that we had to sit in, if they were able to drink from the fountains we had to drink from, I think they would learn to appreciate where they are. Are there recommendations that you have for other educators, in other communities, that how, how do we reach children? What recommendations would you have for them? Actually, I would make one recommendation, and that is everyone reach one. And when I say reach one, reach down and help somebody. Don't be too happy with where you are, because what we do for others will help to pay for the space that we occupy on this world. You know, uh, nothing comes without a price, and we are all here to help somebody else. All of us need to and should want to leave this world a better place. Every job I've had, every opportunity I've had has been to make the situation better. Whatever situation I'm in, my job, my role is to make this world a better place to live. So the legacy that you want to be remembered by is? That I've made a difference and that I've helped somebody. Maybe not in a big way because my parents taught me that uh, you can't always eat the elephant all at once but you can take it bite by bite. And I think be it racism or whatever else in this world, you just do what you can bite by bite and this world will be a better place to live. Thank you so much for your time, Mrs. Bates. Did you find something you can use? We found everything. I just <laughs> for you. Time to go. <laughs> okay, yeah. Right. Ready? Okay, you want me to describe the mass movements, okay. This is gonna be real quick. Oh, take your time. <laughs> okay, I, I remember you asked me a few minutes ago about the mass movements. Now, we were frightened, really frightened at the mass movements because the troopers and the policemen would share, would line up outside, they would come into church, they would make funny noise, they'd bump our cars when you got ready to leave, and there again, we were taught to try to leave in groups. But, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen outside. You know, sometimes they'd be out there on horses and hitting your cars and making bum sounds and just anything they wanted to do. And there was nothing at all you could do about it. But sit there and pray. So there was a lot of support amongst the community of staying together? Yes. But in the beginning, that was not so. Uh, remember, I told you a few minutes ago, before Dr. King came to this town and started really participating in the mass meeting, because as I recall, the first meeting at Tabernacle Baptist Church, whoever was supposed to speak that night did not come. And it was hard to get someone other than somebody like Reverend Reese or Reverend Anderson to come to the podium, because we didn't know who they would take away from the church at night, you know, they'd be out there bumping your cars, pushing your cars, and doing whatever they wanted to do, so it was really frightening. To attend a mass meeting to begin with was very frightening because there was so many people losing jobs and so many people uh, getting put off land, and it was just awful. And some people had credit in this town, you know, they could not get uh, stuff from the grocery store. They could, not get, they could not get stuff from the shoe store because, you know, you went in the store and the white man told you you didn't have any more credit. 
I remember the first day I worked out about 15 or 16 miles out in the county and I came to town that day and I had a splitting headache and I went to the drugstore over here and I wanted some stand back and the man said I don't have any stand backs for folks like you and he spit and went on back to doing what he was doing but of course you knew you couldn't beat him there was nothing you could do about it. Can you tell us a little more about the law enforcement mm -hmm. and the judges mm -hmm. and people like that here um, in, in, in Selma and, and, and how they sort of contributed to what was going on? Well, they were a part of, I won't say the Ku Klux Klan, but you didn't ever know who the, who the Ku Klux Klan were anyway. But the lawmen at that time could do anything they wanted to do to you. If you were driving, they didn't have to have proper cause to stop you and to arrest you, to take you to jail. They could just do what they wanted to do. So at that time, Jim Clark, who was the sheriff, he would just knock folks down or do anything he wanted to, arrest you. He was Mr. Jim Clark. There was nobody could do anything about Jim Clark. How did you feel when it was the third, on Bloody Sunday, was it? When Bloody Sunday was the first Sunday. The first we didn't one. get any farther than the bridge okay. that Sunday. Huh? When the judge made the ruling that you would be protected. What was the feeling? Living the in the South, then? you were told that you were going to be protected. But I think until we crossed that bridge, we didn't really know what was going to happen to you. And every day we prayed for those brave soldiers who were marching the 50 miles. Because at that time, you know, we knew with them marching, people could throw things at them, they could hit them, they could do anything, even though they were supposed to be protected. But remember, the people that were protecting them were white people for the most part. So we were frightened for them. Mm -hmm. Did you have any positive experiences with white people at this time? I, as I look back over my life, I've always had uh, positive experiences with white people. Um, I've always known through my father who, as I told you early on, was a contractor and built houses for white people. He um, worked for white people like other people in the South. And there were always, like the doctor that came to rescue us when we were in Tennessee, he was a good person, one of the best I've ever known. And I've always known people like that. We live in Chambers County. My mother grew up on a 600-acre farm that her parents owned. And uh, her grandfather was one of the few blacks who had a rubber tie buggy and a buggy with a top over it. And all of our neighbors out on that Judge Brown Road were white. And to this day, I feel like those are some of the best people in the world. There was never a time when we needed them, they didn't come to our rescue. And that's even until today. My mother died two years ago. And uh, her best friend was a white lady up the road and they had been friends ever since before I grew up, before I was born, I guess. Um, they shared quilt pieces, they shared patterns and everything. So I've always known that there are good people all over this world and of both races. That's great. Thank you so much, Mr. Bates. <laughs> you all gonna clean up the English and everything. No, <laughs> this, this oh, please. It comes. <laughs> uh, rough, huh? Oh, outstanding. Uh, what, what was your father's nickname again? My father was named Elijah, E-L-I-J-A-H, Elijah Ramsey. Ramsey. R-A-M-S-E-Y. No. Okay. And my name is Harriet Ramsey, R-A-M-S-E-Y-B-A-T-E-S. Please. I know a Ramsey in Chicago. She was in dental school. Mm -hmm. My dad a Ramsey. She was from Bessemer. Oh, okay. Do you have any relatives in Bessemer? I have some relatives in Bessemer, but I don't pick up that name, but okay. I have some in Birmingham. Yeah. Okay. Mrs. Bates. This is a release that a lot of us use. Okay.